very happy to introduce um, Zeta Avaria Kioti, um, who is visiting us from TUI and will be telling us about payment channels. So, Zeta. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Zeta. I'm a postdoc at the Technical University of Vienna. Uh, and I'm going to present to you today uh, a mul multiple works that I did last year on payment channel networks. Uh, so I will start with a brief introduction on scalability and what payment channels and payment channel networks are. Uh, I guess you all know that uh, cryptocurrencies cannot scale and what we mean by cannot scale is that they have a very low transaction throughput. Uh, specifically Bitcoin and Ethereum can process tens of transactions per second while digital payment uh, systems such as Visa uh, handle thousands of transactions per second. Now, the, the question is, can we actually make the cryptocurrencies scale in an amount uh, such as Visa? And there are multiple solutions proposed towards this direction because the problem is inherent in the consensus layer of uh, the cryptocurrencies of the blockchain. And uh, the solutions can be categorized into major categories. The first one uh, is on-chain solutions, which um, increases the uh, layer one throughput. So essentially, you're trying to uh, make the blockchain itself to handle more transactions per second. And the second one is called layer two, and this is an off-chain solution. And what we mean by an off-chain solution is that the major part of the transaction workload is handled off the blockchain. So uh, typical layer one solutions are designed in a new consensus mechanism, using other structures from a chain, you can go to a DAG, or use sharding which is uh, using parallel blockchains to uh, parallelize um, the, um, the processing of the transactions. Uh, typical layer two solutions are payment channels, which is, the, which is gonna be the focus of the talk today. And another example is side chains. There are solutions that lie in between layer one and layer two, uh, notably uh, commit chains and rollups. Now, most of you would know rollups and they're sometimes considered layer two solutions. But given the fact that they have a very high on-chain uh, footprint, um, I would say they lie somewhere in between layer one and layer two. So uh, you're thinking of like a pure layer two as having like a sub-constant on-chain footprint for transaction kind of thing? Yes, because the thing is with rollups as they are, to have data availability, you need to uh, publish the transactions on-chain. Um, so you can have a constant compression, which is fine, but asymptotically you don't really do anything. While payment channels or side chains, you th theoretically you handle everything of chain and you just, just use the blockchain as a dispute mechanism, uh, resolution mechanism. So I will do a brief introduction on payment channels. If something is not clear, just stop me. So what is a payment channel? Suppose we have Alice and Bob and they want to do multiple transactions uh, or, uh, on the blockchain, but they don't actually want to use the blockchain because of the low transaction throughput, which eventually leads to very high transaction fees. What Alice and Bob can do is they can create a joint account uh, where they lock their funds and they can use them however they want later. So to do so, they create this transaction, which is called a funding transaction. Uh, the notation I'm gonna use or the names is from Lightning uh, because we're gonna focus more on the Bitcoin uh, Lightning Network, which is the implementation of payment channels on Bitcoin. Uh, so the funding transaction has two inputs, which is one from Alice and one from Bob. It represents the coins they put. And the output is uh, something, it's a, it's a UTXO that can be spent by, by the signature of both Alice and Bob. So essentially to close the joint account, we need both parties to agree. Now, before they open that account um, uh, on the blockchain, Alice and Bob uh, give back, create the first commitment transaction and give back to themselves the original distribution of coins. So if Alice put five coins, in Bob 4, we create a transaction that spends the, the output of the funding transaction and says Alice owns four, uh, five coins and Bob four. The moment they have created and signed this transaction, they can open the joint account on the blockchain, which we call a payment channel. Now, from that point on, Alice and Bob can transact uh, arbitrarily many times as long as there is enough capital to do what they want. What I mean by that is the following. Suppose Alice wants to send three coins to Bob. So what will happen is essentially that Alice and Bob will uh, update the distribution of the joint funds to represent what the, the new state after the transaction. So Alice had five, minus three, she will have two. And Bob had four, plus three, he will have seven. And Bob may want to send six coins to Alice. Again, we do the same thing. 
So uh, essentially, the coins in the payment channel, they move like the balls in a row of an abacus, back and forth. But they, we cannot move more than what is existing at the moment. So for instance, in the last eight, if Bob wants to give two coins to Alice, this is not feasible because he does not own two coins. The other important thing is that the money that is locked in a payment channel cannot be used for any other purpose. Any other purpose on the blockchain or any other payment channel that Alice or Bob owns. So essentially, this money is locked there until the payment channel is closed. But how do we close a payment channel? I just want to say that's one of the more helpful, in the previous slide, in the lower right, that's one of the more helpful figures that you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right to think about payment channel. Yes, yeah, because you also can't move, right, from you one light to you another. You can't take money back and forth and you can't take it out. Yeah. <laughs> So um, if you want to close a payment channel, there are two ways. The first way is uh, to do it in collaboration with your, with, your, with your counterpart. So let's say Alice wants to close the channel. So she goes to Bob and say, OK, this is the last distribution that we had agreed on. Let's sign a transaction that spends the output of the funding transaction. If Bob agrees, we're fine. But there is a case where Bob may not be responsive or don't, doesn't want to sign because, for instance, he has zero money in the, in the channel, so he doesn't care anymore. Ali should always be able to get back the money that is locked in the channel unilaterally. So what Alice would do in that case is she would publish the latest commitment transaction. I will remind you that the commitment transactions that we saw before, they're all the same. They, they are all spending the output of the funding transaction. They just have a new distribution, which means that in the eyes of a miner, they're all equivalently valid. And the miners, they don't know how many updates have happened in the channel because only Alice and Bob know if they have done five or ten transactions. So they cannot tell which is the latest commitment transaction. Why is that important? Uh, the reason is because Alice may benefit from publishing an older commitment transaction where she held more coins. And as we said, Bob at the moment is not reactive. So what could happen is that Alice could publish this previous transaction and the channel then would close uh, in an incorrect state in the sense that Alice would steal money from Bob. To avoid that from happening, the way commitment transactions are created makes sure that the output of Bob is always spendable immediately, but the output of Alice, which is the party that publishes the transaction, is time locked for a period that is called the dispute period. The reason this period exists is because we want Bob to be able to go online during that period and challenge Alice in case she commits fraud. If, if this happens, if Alice commits fraud and Bob challenges that on chain, uh, then all the money of the channel is awarded to Bob. So his money and Alice's money is awarded to Bob because uh, we want to punish the cheating party. That is a high level description of how lightning works. Um, yeah. I mean, is it helpful to figure out, I mean, these days you hear a lot about fraud proofs in the context of optimistic rollups. So, I mean, that kind of like this is like a natural conceptual precursor to that. Is that fair? Or? Uh, I think it's much easier because the revocation for uh, the bridge remedy for lightning is pretty much uh, a secret. It's like uh, releasing the pre image of a hash. Uh, so, that is much easier than prove, proving fraud, I guess, in the, in the roll-up, because the roll-up wants like Merkle proofs and stuff like this. Right. So, can I think of it as just like a particularly simple fraud proof? Like yeah, it is. Proof? Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Generally, I think payment channels are the initial idea, and roll-ups were developed slowly from going to like commit chains, which is the, the predecessor of roll-up, is pretty much um, a structure that's like a payment hub. And they said, OK, I don't want to lock that much capital. Let's make the commit chains. And then the commit chains became the roll-up. So yeah, I think there is much correlation between all of these. And there are trade-offs. Pretty much a trade-off between a roll-up and a payment channel is um, the on-chain footprint versus how much capital you lock. Because if you lock the capital needed to do all transactions, then you're secure. You don't need fraud proofs in that sense. You don't, you, you don't need that. But then the more you re, uh, relax the capital, the more information you need to publish on the chain. This is how I perceive that. Right, so often it's a role of like zero capital. Yeah. But I mean, they have some low. No. Constant sort of transaction. Right? Yeah. What I described before is a payment channel between two parties. 
However, the power of payment channels is mainly, mainly lies on the, on the fact that they can create a network. And what I mean by that is that if Alice and Bob do not share a payment channel, but they are connected through a path of chain payment channels, they can still send the transaction to each other. Now, how is this feasible? Um, the important part is that there is a connection, uh, like a path, um, where the edges are the channels and the nodes that participate in the channel that are the um, nodes in the graph. Um, and that path has enough capital on every edge. So for instance, if Alice wants to send three coins to Bob, she has to have enough money on her side, of course. It's five here, you can see it's, uh, she can send the money. And the intermediary, let's say Charlie, has to have enough coins also. In this case, this is feasible. Now, there are two things that are important in uh, implementing such an idea. The first one is that we need all the transactions in the path to happen atomically. And that means that either all the transactions go through or none of them go through. The second thing is uh, that the intermediary does not do that altruistically, typically. They ask for a fee. This fee in the Lightning Network is quite low at the moment. But uh, this opens up a whole dimension, as we will see later, for game theory applications. Uh, let's see quickly uh, how we can achieve um, the atomicity of transactions along a payment path. So uh, the tool that we use in this case, the simplest tool, is to use a hashed, hashed time lock contract, which is a contract that says that um, Alice will pay Bob a specific amount uh, if Bob can provide the pre-image of a hash, else if the time passes by and Bob doesn't do so, the money is returned to Alice. So essentially, you hash lock something and you also time lock it. You say, uh, you can take the money if you give me the secret or not take the money if you don't give me the secret during that period of time. Uh, the way we use it to achieve atomicity is that uh, we ask the receiver, in this case Bob, to create a, a secret that he only knows, send the hash of that secret to the sender, so Alice, and then Alice creates that with the intermediary, with Charlie, and says, I'm going to give you that. Uh, you can take the money if you know the secret that Bob has, but within two days. And then Charlie creates a similar thing with Bob and says, you can take the money from the channel as long as you do it within one day. The reason we want the decrease in time locks is for having um, for ensuring security, like the, the intermediary is not, uh, will never lose money in that way. So if Bob triggers that, if Bob triggers the, uh, the dominance of HDLCs, then everybody will have enough time to claim the money from the previous person. If Bob doesn't do anything, then every, for all of the channels, the money will be returned to the sender. Um, so the point is, the, the Y is the same in all of these HLTCs, is that right? Yes, So yes. as soon as somebody knows, they can just copy paste that same solution to unlock the previous one, right? What, you can copy paste? Like the Y, so yeah, shows yeah, you yeah. the, so shows you the X, even the Y, and you can just copy paste the X to get. Yes. Okay. So uh, this is a very old image of the Lightning Network. <laughs> and um, at the moment, I checked yesterday, apparently we have 85,000 channels, 70,000 nodes. Huge increase. Very happy to see that. Um, and there are multiple problems. This seems like a very nice solution. But there are multiple problems that need to be uh, handled uh, from routing, from liquidity, and we will see some of them in the rest of the talk. Now, so we also, so we talk about all for payments. Is that the possibility of extending to the more general limitations? Or is there something yes. There are these things that are called state channels. Uh, for instance, sprites. Next week, Pat McCord is visiting. He's the author of that. He can tell you much more. Um, in principle, yes. I don't know if it's used anywhere. I mean, even payment channels are not really <laughs> used in some sense. I'm going to discuss about three uh, different directions. Uh, the one is called rebalancing. This is the main focus of today's talk. Uh, the second will be a little bit about routing uh, in some specific cases of graphs and uh, a specific business model. Um, and the third, the, the last work I want to talk about, if there is time, is about um, um, game theoretic analysis of the primitive of a payment channel. So um, the first problem that payment channels have is liquidity. And the reason is we lock, that we lock the money in the channel for a very long period of time, and this money cannot be used anywhere else. 
So uh, in payment channels, it is very often the channels are depleted. And if the channel is depleted, uh, sorry, depleted means that uh, one edge of the channel has uh, not enough coins. Um, we need to top up the channel, and this typically is done by going on the blockchain. Um, now, there, for the, to avoid this, there was a solution proposed that is uh, to rebalance uh, channels in a cycle. And this can be done off-chain. Let me be more specific. Imagine we have that graph. And uh, by, uh, you see the nodes and you see that the channels are, uh, you can see the capacities of the channels in both sides. And with red, you can see what ideally the parties would want in a channel. So for instance, in the channel between A and D, uh, now A owns six coins and D owns zero coins. But they would like to have a more balanced, let's say, distribution. So they would say, I would prefer to have three and three. Now, if we have all these preferences, then we can find if there are cycles where we can move all together atomically the money along the channels. As I said before, the money cannot jump from channel to channel. But what can happen is that we can find the minimum amount, let's say two, for which A will move the money to D, D to B, and B to A. And that will create a more balanced um, uh, payment network. Now, it is important that, of course, no user loses money. And in, what do we mean about losing money is that the amount, the sum of the coins each vertex has remains the same. So, for instance, A, node A, in the beginning had 13 coins, 6, 6, and 1. And at the end, again, has 4, 3, and 6, which is again 13. Uh, is, this, is, is it clear, the idea of rebalancing? Great. Okay. So uh, there is an easy way to model this problem, and that is that we assume that uh, the users know how much they want to rebalance. And from that, we can create a directed graph where the edge capacities now represent the, amount, the maximum amount you want to rebalance your channel for. And in that graph now, uh, we just need to find circulations, which are flows with a zero net flow for each vertex. There are two solutions. Uh, two prior solutions to our work that do that. The first one is uh, what is implemented in Scene Lightning, and is uh, wo it works locally, so it's a local peer-to-peer uh, -peer search for a cycle, and that means that if somebody wants to uh, do rebalancing, they start and they search um, if there is a cycle to do so. That is actually uh, very computationally. Um, this is very slow, so. The advantage is that it is lightweight and asynchronous. Every person can do it on their own. They don't need any coordination whatsoever. But the problem is that during the time that you search to find such a rebalancing cycle, the balances of the channels, because it is very slow, um, may change. Because the, some of the in-between channels, they may actually do some transactions or do another rebalancing. So what you thought that uh, the cycle existed at the moment might fail. And of course, yes. Did you specify sort of like the goal should be that for every single channel they get closer together when you do this operation or there's some measure that says this graph is more balanced than that graph or like is there a clear specification for what the objective is? No. So uh, the thing is, um, the, what we can say is that we want to do as much as possible, like the maximum flow, right? This is the optimal for us. But what is balanced, it depends on the two users. Because for someone, balance may be you have 10 and you have 100 because the A node sends more money typically to B. Uh, for another one, maybe 50-50, so you don't know. It's, yeah. This is why we as I say, we ask the users what they want to rebalance for, and then we create the graph. So the idea is that like, every, every user would say, I like this better than this. And if all the users in the cycle say they like this better than this, then this is what the cycle would do. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's not exactly user because it's more like a channel. The two people have to agree in the channel. But yes, the idea is everybody submits their wants. And uh, if the wants match or the minimum amount for which they match can be, re can be rebalanced. So just to follow on that, to you know, understand the constraints. So, so you get a number for each payment channel along the direction. So the, the ideal amount to move. 
you okay good <laughs> because I was going to say what's the optimization problem yes so exactly <laughs> so that that goes to the second work because uh, um, the, I told you what is this the first main thing for the local search is that it's not optimal also so um, Arthur Gervais three years ago proposed revive uh, which is an opt-in protocol and they model the problem as a linear program and the, the, the optimization is simple. We have the capacities, which are the amount that we want to rebalance. We want the flows uh, that maximize the sum of flows, let's say. Uh, we want to maximize the amount of flows through the network. We have to respect the capacities on every edge. And we need to preserve uh, the flow on every vertex. That's it. The problem with this work is that the, I'll explain first how a high level. So the idea was you somehow select a delegate. And then uh, this delegate gets all the constraints from every user, computes the solution, returns it to the users. Then the users uh, verify it's a correct solution. And they agree to execute it or not. And if they ag all agree, then they do an atomic execution uh, across the whole network. Sorry, can I yeah. ask another question about this? Yes. So the capacities are the actual capacities of the channel, the no. capacities are input by the channel. They're input by the owners of the channel to say, this is the maximum that I would like to adjust. Yes. Got it. Yes. I understand. So is it fair to say like it's assuming that the utilities for each edge, for each pair of nodes, is like linear in how much we balance it we do? You could say that, yes. I mean, <laughs> Assumption in this yes. way. It is an underlying assumption, yes, I would say so, because you want to maximize the flow. If it was not, if it was not linear, it would be a different function, I guess, because you, it would be, for instance, more important to have one channel that is more full to the balancing request, or a lot of channels that are all of them a little bit. So yes, it is an underlying assumption. Uh, so the main disadvantages of the problem is First of all, you have a uh, lack of privacy completely because you have just one delegate. The delegate gets every information and then it returns the whole solution. So everybody sees everything pretty much. Uh, the second is you have no robustness. And uh, that is because, as I said, when you, every user gets back the solution, they can choose or not to uh, take part in the execution. Then if one party, one player disagrees and doesn't want to go through with it, the whole solution is um, unimplementable, let's say. Like, you cannot ex execute it. And the third is minor, uh, but it's, it, has, it requires smart contracts, so it's not compatible with Bitcoin. So um, in the work that we uh, presented this year uh, on financial crypto called Hide and Seek, we tried to solve exactly these problems. So the properties that we wanted was to have an opt-in protocol that is applicable on Bitcoin and has four major properties. The first one is uh, security. By balance conservation, we mean that no node loses money. Um, the second is privacy. So we wanted um, the users to know exactly what they would need to know to execute an HDLC. So if you're in a cycle, your predecessor, your successor, and the amount, that's it. Any further information should not be revealed by, by the protocol. The, uh, of course, we wanted to maintain optimality. Uh, so we wanted to maximize again the, the flow that uh, goes through the rebalancing uh, protocol. And we wanted to increase robustness. Um, and by that we mean if uh, have some fault tolerance, if some person doesn't want to participate, to not break down the whole execution. Now, a high level uh, description of our protocol is as follows. We have two phases. The first one is the exploration phase and the second the execution. Uh, the exploration phase, uh, we, we again formulate the problem as a linear program, a mean cost flow problem actually. And then what we do is we, um, we select k uh, nodes at random using, for instance, um, cryptographic sortition. It's not important, it's adaptable how you choose the nodes. Uh, and then every user secret shares their constraints to this k node. Then this K node run a multi-part computation protocol and it return later to the users the results that are only, only relevant, the flows that are relevant for them only. Now during the execution phase, uh, the execution phase uh, is done with basic HTLC. And the reason we can use HTLCs is that because before we um, execute the solution, 
we decompose it to uh, sign consistent cycles. What do I mean about for, with that? Um, I mean that if we have, for instance, um, the, the normal solution that, for instance, revive would uh, return would be uh, the, the sum of the blue and the, and the red cycle. So it would be 10, 10, uh, a horizontal 4, 6, 6. But what we do is we break uh, the, the flow in sign consistent cycles such that we increase the robustness. So for instance, if the, the node C decides to uh, not participate, that does not affect what happens in, uh, in the red cycle, right? It only affects what happens in the blue cycle. So our goal is to create as many, uh, possible, as many cycles as possible. Now the other advantage is that um, uh, we need, to, we need this, the, the cycles to be sign consistent because if they're not, so in this example, the the node may have incentive to sign uh, the one HTLC go in one direction, but not the other one, because it goes against the rebalancing request that the node asked for. So, uh, but this can be done. It's uh, it's an algorithm that already exists. So yeah, I'm just use it. It's called conformal decomposition. How to? Conformal decomposition. Really? Didn't know. <laughs> okay. And the last um, important thing to note is that um, MPC generally is a very heavy tool, uh, but in our case, uh, we believe, we have not run simulations, that it, is, uh, it can run in a few minutes. And the main reasons are, uh, first, the number of delegates, that can be very small, like three, four. Um, and as long as we have one correct, then we have pri uh, one honest, we have privacy and correctness. The second is, we don't use generic LP, but we use a mean cost flow uh, formulation, which is apparently is faster. And the last one is that uh, the structure of our problem guarantees that we have an integer uh, solution, which means that we use uh, integer uh, arithmetic, not uh, floating point arithmetic. So, so comparing back to the revive thing, uh, they don't have MPC. They I just, understand. Yeah. There's, there's a couple of things I want to give you now. They clearly don't have everyone, right? They don't have privacy. But maybe they do have the energy solution property, I would guess. And I would think they would also have the conformal decomposition property. Uh, they that, don't. <coughs> or I think you could do it. I mean, that's sort of a generic yes. property that flows. Yes, yes. The, you could do it because what we did is essentially took revive and try to fix the problems one by one. So yes, if you uh, apply our algorithms to revive, you'll end up with hide and seek. Right. Yeah. So, there's, so there's some parts that you said it's, it's you know, Revive had it and it's good, and you also have it and it's still good. And there's other parts that they didn't have and now you do have. I just want to yes, that, that. that's it. Yeah. So. Yes, Revive had the optimality. Yeah. Now you have privacy yeah. and robustness and I don't remember the third point. <laughs> but yeah. Now, um, I would like to talk about an ongoing work that's happening uh, is building on top of hide and seek. It's uh, with some of the co-authors of hide and seek, and that is uh, more directed to the people that uh, work on auctions here. I would be happy to have some input because we're stuck. So um, naturally, uh, when you do rebalancing, you think first to involve the participants that want to rebalance, but. Uh, since the fees in Lightning, for instance, are very low, it could be that most of the people that want to rebalance would be willing to pay a very low fee to the people that uh, are intermediaries, right? So the same way that a transaction can go through and the intermediary asks for a fee, the same way the intermediary can enable a rebalancing cycle. And that is probably much less uh, costly compared to actually going on-chain and topping up the channel. So now this creates a new, uh, a new question. Uh, we have the service providers that are willing to um, get some money by enabling the people to rebalance. And we have the people that want to rebalance and are willing to give some money for this purpose. So essentially what we have is users that submit bids that are positive. These are the buyers, so the people that want to rebalance. And some that have negative bids, which are the sellers that want to get money for this purpose. Now we have an optimality shift. So before we wanted to maximize the flow, now we want to maximize the social welfare. And we end up with a mechanism design problem. So the questions we want to answer is how to make the users submit their bids truthfully. And to do so, we need to answer how do we price the cycles. So, so what's, what's the semantics of the bid exactly? 
the semantics of a bid. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. It depends on which model, but the simplest would be I would help to do one unit of rebalancing for 0.1 unit of, um, uh, of payment. Uh, even even simpler. I mean, Just like either or, like either either do this specific rebalance and I'll pay you something, or don't do it and I'll pay you nothing. That's kind of just like the two. Mm, I would say it's more like a. No, a double auction, I would say. Like, I'm willing to give up to that amount of money. You're give, you want at least that amount of money. Oh, I see. So from the intermediaries, you're also taking bids. Yes. You're having bids for both. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Is it that every unit of rebalancing is going to be a second and every edge as well? Because like... Yes, every so edge, I would just say. Just every edge? Every edge. So the intermediaries, just think of them as the networks. It's like the intermediary, yes, it can be, imagine it like an edge, yes. I mean, it is a vertex, it is a node, but um, the node is using a specific channel. If that node sends the money, so he's losing capital on his side, he's the only one getting a fee. The other one is gaining, he doesn't need a fee. So that's the idea. So yes, it is an edge, so uh, where the sender is only getting a fee. That's the generally the idea of providing a service and asking for a routing fee. So, 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 yeah. so just following our next question. So we should think about like each node is like getting paid interest on whatever capital they have. Yeah. And so you're saying basically the more stuff comes to you, you're also getting paid off just sort of in the form of additional interest. Yes. Whereas the other side of the edge is sort of losing the capital and then you're sort of in effect refunding them more yeah. lost interest. Okay. Yeah, you're paying the opportunity cost of being able to send that money for someone else, for instance, or doing something for their own good. So typically what the, the fees in Lightning is one Satoshi plus 0.000033 percent uh, times the value. So it's a base fee plus uh, a, a constant times the value. Um, so in this uh, auction, pretty much, what are the properties that we want, ideally? We want optimality, of course which is called economic efficiency. We want incentive compatibility, so we want the users to truthfully tell us their bids. We want rationality, which means um, we should never charge the players more than the bids. And we finally want strongly budget balance, and that is what creates the most problems, problems for us. Uh, so we want the zero net flow to maintain for every vertex. And that is important because at the moment, at least I'm not aware of a way to burn money in a channel. So due to the construction, the, the primitive construction of payment channels, we cannot have a weekly budget balance. And we know that these four properties are impossible. So now we go and see what we can do. Now, the first idea, of course, yes. Does the budget balance include the fees or is it not including the fees? Uh, okay, let's ignore the fees. For, uh, yeah, yeah, typically, yes, you have to transmit the whole thing with the fees. Yeah. Yes, but the fees are very small in comparison, typically, to the, um, to the whole value. Yeah. But yes, you have to transfer the fees around the cycle, for instance, if you... Yeah. Um, I mean, they might be small, but still relative to each other, right? They have some non-zero values. So. Yes, but in that aspect, we are not. We don't require a zero net flow because I mean you have to take into account what is paid. So is it zero fees? Yeah, yeah. formally yes. Uh, and actually, it's a, we want a, a property that is stronger even than that because that in a graph, strongly budget balance, would mean that a vertex that can have like three edges, you want them th these three edges to sum to zero. If we use the sign decomposition, um, the the cyclic decomposition we want cyclically strongly budget balance. We want every single cycle to sum up to zero. Now, the first idea, of course, was to use for a price auction uh, in the sense that we price someone, their bid minus the social welfare divided by the number of... Sorry, yeah. Yeah, that's still a question. So, um, what are the utilities? So, like, you said, think of the bidders as the edges. Was, was it something on the set of uh, functions that the utilities of the edges come from? Like, sorry, is you're saying truthful, what, what is my utility function like as an edge? Um, I would say what you, uh, what you rebalance minus what you pay. 
So it's a linear function in how, so you have some ideal, like in the previous world, I would have submitted five, and yeah. now my utility is again. Okay, let me think. So, um, so I think the utility is like, like that term of utility is pro rata in respect to how much was filled, is my interpretation. Right, so, like, if I declare that it's value intending me to be filled to move five, yeah. and then eventually move three, yeah. right, then, it's, then my utility is like 10 times five thirds, or, or sorry, 10 times three fifths. Three fifths. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Uh, yeah. 10 okay. times, 10 times three fifths. Well, function. Yeah, so, so, so is it big, is it big both the price and quantity? Yes. Two numbers? Okay. Yes, and it is linear. Yes, it, the function is linear. Uh, so here, for instance, what did we do? We, we took the bids and we uh, priced the people with the, um, uh, the bid minus what they gained, the social welfare, divided by the number of the participants. So we had the same problem as first price auction, pretty much, which is um, if you want to be included, you are motivated to overbid. But if you have a solution, you want to underbid because you pay less. Uh, so no incentive compatibility. Sorry, can I ask, um, so uh, is what you're saying is a strongly budget balance. This is referring to kind of like the allocations or like, so, so I understood the answer. Just question that like, if you forget the fees, you need to do something that's strongly budget balance. You need to solve that but, problem. But after doing this, you can charge people whatever you want for the solution, like if for some reason this solution is very valuable to me, you would separately charge me a whole Bitcoin or something? No. Um, so what the, the way to find the solution, we have no problem because then you can use differential privacy. We, I mean, the, the problem we end up having is always pricing the one cycle. Like you have done, you have a solution, you have the decomposition, and then you have this situation where people have submitted this, for instance. These are the bids. How do we price it? We do not have a way to do that incentive compatible and maintaining the zero net flow around removing the fees, yeah. The, this is the problem. I think I'm confused how you charge prices. Uh, it depends on which solution. <laughs> In any solution, like how, what are the mechanics by which you charge prices? This is exactly what we're trying to solve. So um, given the, the bits, right? Uh, for instance, in the first solution, as I said, we, uh, we use the bits minus uh, the social welfare divided by the number of participants. Here, we run the problem multiple times. For instance, we removed some participants, some cycles broke down, we solved the problem again, then we saw how much was beneficial, so typical VCG. Um, how, how do I pay? Like if everything has to be strongly budget balanced, then my payment is always zero. Uh, so, so like how like like uh, uh, how do people like how do you charge payments or can you charge payments or what are the constraints on the payments you charge outside of this? Market? You don't have to be uh, so for uh, um, in payment channels you can send more. I mean it doesn't need to be the rebalancing need to be zero flow. The fees that you send or whatever you want, as long as there is slack. Yeah. The, the slack also, we assume it exists, because that is also something that is a hidden assumption. We assume that we have the, the space, the, the capacity in the real channel to send these fees around, but typically they're very low, that's why we assume that. So yeah, in any, in any solution that we tried, we ended up always having that problem, and uh, we don't know how to solve that problem. Yes, sure. No, just what is the scratch? So these are the bids. So these are the bids. So um, l let's say unit flow, uh -huh. okay? And A uh, to D uh, says I'm willing to pay up to 10 okay. to do that unit flow. Then one, then one, then minus one. How do we divide that such that the people will truthfully tell us the bids? And the, uh, the, the flow will be also zero net. So can you go back to your list of properties? Yes. Cool. Yes, I mean, what really, um, what really drives the impossibility here is one in four. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, like truthfulness, forget about truthfulness, like, I mean, so it's just really at equilibrium, you're not gonna get, 
welfare optimality and budget balance. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of a very robust fundamental hostility result. So I mean, like, I, I mean, it's, it's you know, relax something. And have, I mean, one of those two has to be relaxed to, for anything to be possible. I think. So I think that's is, is the question. How? Which one? How much? Because. Uh, well, so it depends which. I mean, it sounds like your application may insist that four cannot be relaxed. Yeah. In which case, the only question, in some sense, is you know, minimize the welfare loss so that it's all the rest of the properties. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I like it's convenient and it's truthful, but that's not actually. I wouldn't say that's sort of fundamental to the design problem. If you can find easily how to manipulate the price to gain more or less. But you really care about the outcome, right? You don't really care about the manipulation so much. Like you just care about like, adding equilibrium. Again, it's convenient if it's like very straightforward to figure out how to participate. But if you have it, I mean, like first price options are not truthful, but they're actually very useful, right? Yeah. Like they still do good things, right? So even if you have like a non-truthful, but add equilibrium at bounded welfare loss, mm -hmm. I think that would be an amazing result, for example. I'm really not an expert on this topic. Mm -hmm. Trying to understand most of the things while we're writing this. <laughs> now I will move on to routing problems. Um, so the first, uh, the first paper, this is uh, wiser. Uh, I will explain a bit. So it's motivated by uh, noticing a behavior in, uh, in payment channel networks where uh, wealthy participants create multiple channels. They are uh, charging fees to route transactions. So this is a way to gain money. Um, so uh, we assume we have a business model where we have payment hubs, and these payment hubs are connected to clients. So the clients, they're not connected any other way with each other, just through the hubs, much like banks. Um, so that structure, of course, is very beneficial because you have um, high and reliable transaction throughput, but um, it has some problems again. The first one is that you are bound again by the liquidity of the hubs, so that is uh, the bottleneck for the transaction throughput. Then you have the fees you have to pay in the hubs. Uh, that ideally, at the moment, would be uh, proportional to the amounts you're sending. We would like to reduce that. And the third is that you have no privacy for the users. So in our new work, just got accepted at IFT, we propose a solution that's called Wiser, uh, that comes from TransferWise. Um, and we, uh, we try to use transaction aggregation to solve these three problems. So the first one is we want to increase the transaction throughput as much as possible. The second is we want to reduce the fees uh, that uh, the clients pay to the hubs. And the third is to enhance the privacy of the transactions. I mean, all of these properties are done, are achieved optimistically. In very uh, in weird edge cases, you may have zero improvement to doing classic transactions. And by classic transaction, I mean to do transactions sequentially. So the main idea for transaction aggregation is that instead of doing every transaction in the payment hub, like here, uh, one by one when they come, you wait for a period of time, and then you aggregate all the transactions, and you execute them atomically. Um, to see the benefit of transaction aggregation, um, you, I will explain the two examples because it's, it's dual. The first part is that transaction aggregation allows uh, uh, transactions to happen that in the normal uh, payment network, sequentially, they wouldn't be able to happen. Now, assume that you have uh, uh, three transactions, uh, one from V1 to V3 for 10 coins, another one similar, V1 to V3 for 10 coins, and uh, a transaction from V4 to V6, again, for 10 coins. In that payment network, where you can see uh, the, the balances that, that are, um, are denoted by the um, number and where there is none is zero. This is not possible uh, because there is no capacity of 10 in each of these uh, paths. But if you aggregate the transactions, what you notice is that the first and the, or the second is the same and the third transaction are, are possible. Why? Because when you see the problem uh, in the transaction aggregation, you can consider the following. What you really want is V1 to send 10 coins and V3 to receive 10 coins. You don't really care to route it through the network. Then you want V6 to receive uh, 10 coins and V4 to send 10 coins. So what you can do is essentially the same idea as TransferWise does. You can send from V1 to V6 and from V4 to V3 where you have the availability and just make sure that these two things happen atomically. 
And that is that demonstrates mostly what is the gain from this uh, uh, from transaction aggregation. The other part that we gain is uh, that we can use some cancelling out effects, and that effectively reduces the fees a lot. For instance, in the graph, uh, the other the, the, the right left the left graph, you can see um, in the bottom that has a, a transaction vector, and it says okay that V3 wants to send five coins to V5. And then V5, two coins to uh, V3. If you do it sequentially, you would do two transactions and you would pay seven uh, coins in total uh, for uh, transaction fees. If you aggregate them because they cancel out each other, you just send one transaction for three coins from V3 to V5. And then the, the fee that goes proportionally to the amount that you send is reduced more than half. So uh, I think these are the most um, important examples. What we have open, and what is very interesting, and why it doesn't do it, is that theoretically, you could have a transaction vector that says V3 sends 20 to uh, V5, uh, and then V5 sends 12 to V3, and that, in principle, is feasible, because they cancel out of 8. However, we have, um, in, in our protocol, this is not feasible. We have constrained it. So that is open at the moment. Um, this problem is also present in finance. Uh, it's called netting in the interbanking settlements. And it's a, a, a notion of decentralized transfer-wise system. So what's the example? Can you put it that diagram? I, I actually didn't follow the example. Like for the diagram. So for the what? Yeah, for this diagram, you said V1 wants to pay V3 five, 10 coins, right? Uh, in the beginning, no. I said um, five coins from 3 to 5 and two coins from 5 to 3. So they cancel out 5 minus uh, 2 coins is 3. 5 coins from V3 to V5? Yes. So you can see it here. Like this is V3, the third position, sends uh, 5 coins to the last position, which is V5. And then again, V3 receives from V5 2. So it's just going from 3 to 5 and 5 to 3. They cancel out if you aggregate them. No, so what is the, the bottleneck uh, for the payments? No, so what was the transaction that was impossible before, but is possible now with aggregation? Like, what is the... Ah, that is here. Yeah, so what was impossible? What was impossible is to send 10 coins from V1 to V3, okay. and then 10 coins from V4 to V6. Okay. This is not feasible in this network, because you don't have the capacities. But okay. if you take the them together... The bottom is the 4 between uh, 4 to 5 and 5 to 6. Okay. The bottom is... Uh, ah, yes, it's the 4, 4, 4, 4, yes. This is the maximum you can send. This is something more basic, right? Those two diagrams, those three equivalent, and these things. Oh, no, no, no. Are they completely unrelated examples? Completely related examples, yes. It's the one to show that it is feasible to do transactions that you couldn't before. The other is to see there can be a cancelling out that reduces fees. So, so, so V1 and V3 want to exchange 10 coins, but the bottleneck is 4. Yeah. So how is the aggregation solving? Okay, so the way you can look at it is that V1 must send 10 coins, V3 must receive 10 coins, equivalently V6 must receive 10 coins, and V4 send 10. So what you can do is have V1 send it to V6, and then V4 send it to V3, and do that atomically, and you guarantee that everybody has done what they should, although the paths do not allow so. And this is interesting because you can have even disconnected graphs doing it. Yeah. So the aggregation part is just that you're taking two separate transactions and doing them together. Yes, uh, not even two, it's multiple. Yes, but that, that's the main idea. You wait for a time and you take all these transactions and you cancel out all the, the effects and then you have transaction throughput that is higher because more flow is feasible in that way. And one more question. So for the right diagram, what is the bottleneck and what was being solved? Uh, okay. The bottleneck for the right diagram is that in our solution, we use a check at some point uh, that uh, the individual amounts are below the capacity of the channel. And we use it in the solution, in the, in the, um, in the algorithmic problem solution. Uh, and that forbids something that should be feasible, which would be if, v, if node 5 wants to send to node 3, 20, and the node 3 wants to send to 5, 12, the cancelling out is 8, it's below the capacity of the channel. That should be pretty visible, but we need it for other purposes, so 
yeah, that's why it's kind of open. Again, the high level idea is that we have uh, accumulation of transactions, we solve the transaction aggregation problem, we get the resulting flow, we check that the flow is correct, and then we execute it. How do we do that? Similarly to before, uh, we select some nodes from the hubs that have, uh, they're online and they have high computational power. That we secret share, we solve the problem again with MPC. And the interesting part here is that the problem generically is uh, NP hard for transaction aggregation in a generic network, but due to our structure, uh, we use a fixed parameter linear uh, algorithm that runs linear to the number of constraints and exponential to the number of hubs that we select. Um, for the execution, we need to have atomic execution, not like the previous work, but like revive. So to do so, it's not that easy, but there is, fortunately, a work we can use, it's called Thora, a very recent paper also, that makes sure that we can do that. Um, the gains that we have is that we have computational feasibility for a problem that is generally not feasible. Uh, no user loses money. We have maximal throughput. Uh, we are cost efficient in the sense that we reduce the fees as much as, much as possible. And uh, we are private and we show that by de defining an indistinguishability gain. Sorry, what is, what is FP A fixed parameter linear. Fixed parameter tractable algorithm, linear to the, yeah, in, in, for... In what parameter? It's linear to the users for us, to the clients, let's say. But what's the parameter in the fixed parameter? What, uh, the, the exponent. Right, but what parameter is the exponent? It's the number of hubs that we select, okay. yes. For future work, we would be interested if, of course, we can have a more generic graph. As I said, it's an MP hard problem, but uh, this doesn't um, say that we cannot have an approximation algorithm that is good enough. So this is open at the moment. We haven't even uh, started working on it. Now, I will very briefly uh, go through the, the high level of what we did in these two last work because I'm running out of time. Um, now, the main idea for this paper is that we wanted to uh, fi find how to find routes in a payment channel network where we don't know the topology. And our motivation was taproot. So in Bitcoin so far, uh, if you um, had a, a channel opened, everybody could see the creation of the channel. But after taproot, that is not true. So that means that we can have a private network all co all completely if the users don't want to say that they have a channel. Uh, so that makes routing much harder, which was anyway hard before. Um, and we wanted to have something that is private, so it doesn't leak a lot of the topology, uh, that is efficient. And of course, it's optimal in the sense that we find the cheapest route. Um, the very, very, very high level idea is that we have both the sender and the receiver propagate information, encrypted messages in the network. And we use bilinear maps in a way that we can have the intermediaries connect the messages if they receive the same um, the message that is from the same sender and receiver. And that intermediary can then pro back, backwards propagate the path discovery to the sender and receiver, and they can stop the propagation of the message. Um, that is very high level. We want the first phase, the, the first propagation phase, to be quite slow, so the rest can um, effectively stop it from happening later. And we uh, assume that the adversary is passive and that um, we, we demand that the nodes propagate the messages with a delay that's proportional to the fees. So we can find the cheapest path first. That's a high level idea. We have open problems such as how to quantify privacy leakage because um, if the adversary is positioned uh, close to the sender and close to the receiver, so it gets the message from two sides, they can infer a lot of information about the topology. In theory, you can do it in topology hiding manner using MPC, but that is out of the question for practicality reasons here. And of course, there is an efficiency, optimality, and privacy trade-off that has to do with how much you load the network with communication, so to how many people you send the message. So if you send it to every one of your neighbors, you find a solution that is optimal. But if you send it to one of your neighbors, we measure that you, on average, find the twice as worse solution. Uh, and all of this uh, space in between is open. And for the last part, um, uh, this work was also uh, published in Financial Crypto this year. 
and it has to do with a primitive construction of payment channels. As you remember, I said in the beginning that if Alice commits fraud, she can publish a commitment transaction that's sold. And then Bob uh, creates this challenge and goes on chain and says to the miners, give me the money because Alice cheated. That would be true if the miners are willing to include the revocation transaction, which is the one that gives the money to Bob. Um, but Alice, in that case, can actually bribe the miners to not do so. So what she does is she creates a transaction that says, if you don't include the revocation after my timeout expires, I will give you this amount of money. And that creates a game. So the miner at every time step, at every block generation, has to decide between in, in, introduce, in, including the transaction from Bob that gives him a fee that is small, or wait for uh, a specific period of time and include the transaction of files that gives them a higher fee. And we studied when this is a Nash equilibrium, uh, we said the parameter space, uh, we proposed a solution where you, Bob can counter bribe pretty much, and for which amount uh, Bob, the, the channel is still secure because Bob has the slack to counter bribe. And we ended up with um, two specific cases, but the space in between is again uh, um, open. So for, uh, for a very small bribes or very large bribes, we have a solution, but uh, for um, very close, bri the bribing of one and the other being very close, we don't know what happens. Yeah. Can I ask a question? So, yes. um, is, if Alice is herself a minor, yeah. is it like does the game change in the sense that if Alice kind of convinces Bob to put a large bribe to the minors, Alice just gets that bribe because she herself is a minor? Yes, it changes and also changes in other, like in a specific. For the case that we discuss, not really, but for the space in between, which is the most probable to happen, it actually changes because you can do other types of, of attacks if you have mining power, like feather forking. You can not, like, say, okay, I'm not going to mine on top of that if you include the revocation transaction. And there are papers that show that this is actually a good attack. But miners will not mine the revocations, stuff like this. So yes, this is not studied at all. There is a yeah, parameter space that's... Can, yeah. can you can you clarify like the regime where you're saying that the channel actually is secure? Yeah. So um, actually, the channel is not secure. This is what we find. Uh, we say that if the bribe is, as you see, uh, ignore the, the F. The F is essentially the unrelated transaction fees, so we don't care. So if the bribe is greater than the fee of the revocation transaction divided by the computational power of the weakest mining pool uh, is when you should always uh, wait for the, um, uh, to get Alice's bribe, pretty much. Then obviously, if you have the fee of the revocation higher than the bribe, so the counter bribe being higher than the bribe, you're fine, so like this. Our solution for Lightning, for instance, was very simple. We said, okay, calculate the, uh, in the last state, how much money you had? Eight. What's the total money you can get if the revocation is included? Fifteen. So you can bribe for seven. Is that greater or less than what Alice did? That you know the security of your channel pretty much when you sign a transaction if that is incentive compatible for the so, money. So, so the point is that if, if um, Alice could get seven by being honest and she's trying to cheat to get more, then Alice is losing the seven, and so that creates some spread where it's possible for me that I actually have an advantage over her, and sometimes, even if she's a minor receiving the bribe, that it can still be not good for her, a good move for her to do. That makes sense. With this, I conclude my presentation. Well, feel free to ask any other questions you want.